Here's what you're missing over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. From the Gettysburg Museum of History Studios, you're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, patrons, and welcome to this episode of Addressing Gettysburg. And today we have our buddy Tom McMillan on with us yet again for yet another book that he has written. And <laughs> this guy writes books like uh, I put out shows, I guess, like he just keeps doing it. Our flag was still there. And some of you may be saying to yourself, oh, well, this doesn't have anything to do with Gettysburg or the Civil War, so I'm going to skip it. But don't. Don't skip it. You're going to be surprised at some of the connections that there are to Gettysburg and the Civil War. Tom, welcome back. Matt, great to be here. And Cameron, great to be with you. And you know, the idea, I know people would say that, uh, and my friends were surprised because I'm such a Gettysburg dork, <laughs> an Antietam dork, that why would you write this? Well, it actually came out of my previous book, Armistead and Hancock, yeah. about, Lewis, about Lewis Armistead. Right. And I was researching that family. I said, this is a fascinating family. Yeah. It's, a, it's not just the Civil War guy. Right. And then you go back, and even that line in the movie, in the movie Gettysburg, where Fremantle's talking, yep. he said, I understand you're from an illustrious military family, and yep. your uncle was the guardian of the original Star Spangled Banner. So I started looking into that. I thought, this is a really fascinating story. It's been way underwritten, way mm-hmm. underpublicized. And, you know, as with all these things, you start and you're not sure if there's enough of a, enough content for a book there. But when I realized not just that, but the generations of the Armistead family that then kept this like, – the reason it exists in the Smithsonian today, still there, 209 years later – George Armistead took it home mm-hmm. in violation of Army regulation. <laughs> it stayed in his family for 90 years. Yeah. And if that hadn't happened, we wouldn't have this this most iconic flag in U.S. history today. And ju- just the whole machinations in the journey of the flag over 200 years. How is it still there? And there's so many people involved. And I was really fascinated. And it, in the end, as I consider myself a pretty good student of history. I was embarrassed by how little I knew about this before. Yeah. Well, me too. As I was reading through the chapters you said to uh, to do for the interview, um, I was like, man, I, this is amazing. I don't know anything about this. Um, I think I knew Volcano was the uh, the, ship. the, the one yeah. ship. Yeah. But other than that. Um, yeah, we, we tend to know there was a battle. Key was in a ship. He saw the flag. He wrote the anthem. Right. End of story. But I don't know why Key was on the ship. Yeah. Why was he on the ship? He was... Uh, it's a little. I want to say it's a complicated story. It takes a while. He wasn't just out there as a as a, as a tourist. Uh, the the British uh, in their earlier attack in August when they when they marched into Washington D.C. burned the Capitol, burned the White House. Okay. When when they were on campaign, uh, the officers would take over a nice. You know, they wouldn't sleep in tents. They took over a nice house in the area. And on sure. the way in on that in late August, they took over the house of an elderly physician in Upper Marlboro named Doctor William Beans, and he treated them well. What's he going to do? Right. And but on the way back, uh, they came the same way, and there was straggling in the British Army. They had, they had easily taken Washington D.C., burned burned uh, both those big buildings, and there was some straggling. Uh, guys looking for loot and booze, and Beans and his friends didn't like it, and they captured a couple of them, took them prisoner. Mm. Word got back to the British. Mm. They're furious. Mm. They come and they they capture him. He's in his 60s. Shake him, take him to their ship. You might never see your family again. We're sending you to Halifax in Canada. So the family engaged a local attorney, Francis Scott Key, Ah. asked Key if he'll go and negotiate the release. And Key says, I'll try it, but I don't they don't know who I am. So right. he's teamed up with the U.S. prisoner of war exchange agent, Colonel John Skinner. Those guys get on a boat in early September. They, they, they're they going out in the Chesapeake to look for the British fleet. They don't know where they are. Right. It takes them four days. They find them September 7th. Uh, and the British know Skinner, so they welcome them aboard. But this is less than a week before the Battle of Baltimore. They're deep into the planning for the uh, battle. Uh, okay. And and they don't want to give up this. We're not going to talk to you about this old guy. Until Key pulls out letters from some wounded British uh, soldiers who'd been treated well by American doctors. And that gets, okay, we'll uh, let the old man go. Uh, Key says, great, we'll head back tonight. Eh. You've heard us making all these plans to attack Baltimore. So they were actually held out there on their own ship under guard. Okay. And they, the British thought they were going to win the battle. So said, you'll be here until the battle's over. And they may have thought that Skinner, as a U.S. government official, could uh, help facilitate the surrender because they, you know, they were going to win. And some <laughs> historians believe that the ship may have actually been tethered to the admiral ship for that reason. Oh. But that would have given Key a pretty good view of, of what was going on. Right, okay. 
So, so you often read he was a prisoner. It wasn't really a prisoner, but he was, but they were detaining him he was, because he would have had information that he would have told. Sure. You know, okay. You know, that American makes sense. Then. So that's why he was there. So he wasn't arrested. He just no. wasn't allowed to leave. Right. Okay. Exa- exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 you know, if they had not been planning an attack, I'm sure he would have been. Sure. It's all, all these circumstances come together. And that was one of the many things that I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. As I'm finding. And, and, and he. It all makes sense then after a while. For, for a while, I mean, I knew he was a lawyer, but I might have learned that detail within the last 15 years, let's say. Um, I always assumed that he was a poet. Yeah. Um, I knew he was on and a we're prison gonna get, ship. We're, we're going to get into this. This He did not write the song as a poem. That's, no. That's one of the great myths in American right. history. You're always and, well, about. and that's the other but thing. he was a poet. A bad poet, but he was a poet. <laughs> Right. But he wrote it to the melody of another song that already existed. He, he knew the song. Yeah, he knew. And what it. was the name of the song? To Anacreon in Heaven. What is it? To Anacreon in Heaven. To Anacreon so, in Heaven. We, I can, the hell does that mean? I can get into it now. Go or, ahead. Okay. Let's get into it. Yeah. <laughs> what the hell does that mean? Why not? Yeah. <laughs> I, I love these interviews because we just jump all over the place. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's like sitting in a bar yeah. and like a conversation. Well, that's there's, exactly there's right. No order. There's no. Uh, that, that, uh, this uh, is an NPR. Uh, no offense to NPR. Yeah. yeah the, in, what? We're all taught, and what you'll read on 99% of the things written about this is that Key wrote a poem. He wrote a poem, and that somebody noticed uh, afterward, wow, this poem fits exactly with this musical tune, this very difficult musical. What a miracle. It must have been <laughs> preordained. And the reality is the tune that we know is the Star Spangled Banner. Da, na, 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 na. Very well known to Francis Scott Key and many Americans, 1814. Mm. It's written... Over in England in the 1700s, 1770s, hmm. uh, for an upscale British gentleman's club. You also hear it's a it's a British drinking song, like it's 100 bottles of beer on the wall. Right. These guys were aristocrats. Right. They would get yeah. together sumptuous dining and fine wine, and they fancied themselves great singers, and they wanted a song to challenge their vocal range. The club was named for the ancient Greek poet Anacreon, ah. and their club song was to Anacreon in heaven. Ah. It's a silly song, okay. but it goes to the tune, and the society concept was very popular, so popular it spread across the ocean to the U.S., so there was societies in New York sure. and other cities, and the song became very popular. And what happened back then is that rather than continually writing new music, not having the communication ability we have today, they would merely rewrite lyrics to popular tunes. And this song was rewritten numerous times before 1814. Okay. It was a 1798 song for President John Adams to Adams and Liberty, all sorts of fun songs, political songs. He himself wrote lyrics to the song in 1805, nine years before the Battle of Baltimore. So, okay, so this is in his head. Yes, and, and in that song, it was for a, the U.S. Navy won a big victory over the Middle East, Battle of Tripoli, and they were honoring oh, yeah. a guy in D.C., asked Key to write something. He writes, When the Warrior Returns. And the last two lines of the first verse, he rhymes, Wave and Brave. Wave and Brave. Uh-huh. And the third verse, he uses the, fra- uh, uses the phrase, the Star Spangled Flag of Our Nation. Okay, in so, 1805. So this is something he's got he working on song, in his head. He knew the song. He'd use concepts. Yes, concepts. And, that's what and I'm ended up, for. He ends up writing the song two days after the battle. I mean, the, you know, he's, the, he sees the flag the morning of September 14th. They don't release him right away because the British thought they were going to win. They didn't have a plan for what would happen if they wouldn't be successful. Right. So they had to figure that out, and they pull back. Two days later, so Key, Beans, and Skidder are released. And that night, September 16th, two days after the battle, he takes a hotel room and he writes his song. So he does it within – and I, I always make the point because my book is most – focuses on the flag, but the, the anthem is part of it. Key never set out to write a national anthem. Right, There's so not. much criticism. that He was merely writing about his experience – of witnessing a, as a lawyer, non-military, who witnessed a battle from that close two days earlier, and it's really his emotions. And if you look at the four verses, and most people don't know there are four verses, right. he writes sequentially about his emotions. In fact, we sing the wrong verse. He claims victory in the second verse. Mm-hmm. The first verse ends with a question mark. Yeah, l- l- get into that because that that was something that was fascinating. Originally, there was a question mark, and what, which which here? Let me read it to the people here. Oh, say does that star spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave? Question mark. Yes, it's not home of the brave. And that's you know. what it, and it's the second verse when he says, "Tis the star spangled banner, oh long may it wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave." Explanation point. Right. He's writing 
they didn't know who won the battle. He's writing sequentially. Yeah. It, it, what's happening? Those guys must have been. The really frustrating thing about Key is the most he gave us were his lyrics. He never wrote about this in detail. So he I was going to ask you that. How do you know the story of how he wrote it? Did he Was he interviewed by people later, or how do we he, know this? He, friends knew it. He, you know, At the time, contemporary in Baltimore, we know when he did it. He took it to the home of his brother-in-law on the morning of September 17th. Okay. And and so that we know, and they printed it that day. And there were a hundred uh, handbills, basically broadsheets that they passed out. That was the first time uh, it was. And it and the so title it's two days after the battle. Well, the seventeenth. He three, wrote it two, two days after. The so he wrote it two days after the battle. And how the morning, long? The morning of the seventh. The next day, the morning of the seventeenth. Three days after the battle. He has it printed. Yeah, they have it printed because his his uh, his brother in law, Judge Joseph Nicholson, had been one of the militia soldiers at Fort McHenry. Mm. He reads, he's overwhelmed. He's just experienced this battle, right? And all the businesses had closed down, but they got a young pressman to open the in paper, and they re, they printed a one page broadsheet, okay. thousand copies, and the title there is "Defense of Fort McHenry." Mm. He never called his song "The Star Spangled Banner" or anything. He never gave it a. He just wrote the lyrics. Right. We think it was Nicholson or one of his friends who gave it the very mundane title of "Defense of Fort McHenry." It's about a month later when it's performed at a at a music house in Baltimore that we think maybe one of the music store owners named it "The Star Spangled Banner." But right there on the morning of the seventeenth, it says "To Anacreon in Heaven." So they knew right away that it was that that was the tune, and and most people would recognize what that was. So it's interesting because that's. I I mean, I guess we some, you know, now with copyright laws, it's harder to do that. But I, I, it's, oh, I, I take it like Especially in those. Lawyer. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> but I take it in those days, it was a lot easier for people to do that yeah. because there were no copyright there, laws. There were, and, and, uh, and, and in the midst of a war, in the midst of a battle, you can kind of do whatever you want. Yeah, to yeah, do. yeah. I think it was just an emotional thing. But the point is, so he never gave us a lot of detail about his experience. And most of what we have really are his lyrics. Uh, he gave a speech a few decades later, but again, it was mostly on the emotion. So we, you do have to piece, piece it together a little bit. And it, in the book, I, and I try to say it when I'm when I'm piecing it together. I say I'm piecing it together. This is what I conclude. People can conclude differently, but I, right. I I think I'm on. I think we're on the right track here with, you know, with, with what happened, what he was doing. But he, he he the first verse, he's not sure. And I can tell you, as you know, I worked in sports. I worked for the Pittsburgh Penguins as a VP of communications, and there were probably two or three times a season. When I would have to get called as the history dork, I would get called back to the customer service booth because there was somebody frothing at the mouth who had seen the lyrics to the anthem and saw the question and wanted to know if we were saying the Americans weren't free and brave. Right. It's amazing I what had it, to explain to them what it, very calmly because they're yelling at you, you know, and I the, the spittles on your face, and, I, <laughs> and I'm trying to explain this story. This is long before I wrote the book. I just sure. knew this little part. In fact, that might have been part of getting my interest in it. The one <laughs> <laughs> so I could explain to people who were who were yelling at me, and then they say, "Oh my God, I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't know that." Because it, when you think of it, it makes sense. But they conclude. So I will now. I always tell my wife whenever we go to a sporting event in a different city, we look to see if the question marks at the end. Yeah, now I'm going to do that. Sometimes it's not, and I bet it's not because those people have been yelled at and had no one on staff <laughs> who could explain it to them. <laughs> Doesn't that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. But that that is a uh, uh, a very interesting point that an X or that a a punctuation mark can change. I mean, it does. It changes the whole meaning of a sentence. But isn't that weird how the words don't change at all? Right. Just the yeah. punctuation mark, and it's a completely different sentence. And because writing was the way you communicated back then, yeah. it was so much more important then than it is now when Absolutely. we write in text language. Yeah. We don't even spell words correctly. We don't even use punctuation. No, we don't. Oh, but that's it was so, so important back then. Is and, and I think the younger the person reading this, it's important to emphasize that. Yeah. That it was important back then. That is a significant thing. So, so uh, going through the song and reading, it until I doing this project, I would have known. I can now see what I think he was trying to get in all four of those verses, right? And that was that was his purpose. So it was it was it was quite an amazing feat. But again, I also think Key would be astonished to know that that song's the national anthem. It didn't become the national anthem until 1931, right? It was a very popular song, but there were lots of songs we just didn't have it. We didn't have an official anthem. 
So I think you know with so we never we never had one before no, that. No, there no. Oh, okay, no. and there were you know there were coming out of this there were still very popular songs from the revolution. Yeah, Yankee Doodle, Yankee Hail Do- Columbia, well, right. Columbia, the Gem of the Ocean, Civil War, Battle Hymn of the Republic. All these songs are there. I mean, the Union Army played this during the war, but they played numerous songs. It wasn't anything. Listen to the rest of this interview and dozens like it. Support the show and get early access to special episodes, early and discounted ticket sales, and. And more. The second lieutenant level and above gets access to all monthly Patreon episodes. So please go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg, choose a tier, and join. And I thank you in advance.